I'm a senior research analyst at Freedom House, and Freedom House is one of the oldest human rights organizations in the United States. It was founded in 1941, um, and it actually is quite a bipartisan tradition. Uh, it was founded by Eleanor Roosevelt and Wendell Wilkie, and Wendell Wilkie had just lost the election to, to FDR. Uh, so it was a very different world in American politics back then in the 1940s. Um, what Freedom House is best known for, um, among other things, are these um, reports that we do where we essentially give grades to countries on their level of freedom. Um, and one of these, one of these um, reports is called the Freedom of the Press Survey. It assesses media freedom in every country in the world. Um, what most people don't know is when you actually look at the status of media freedom, um, around the world. Only one in seven people live in a country that, that would be rated as having a free media. Um, and that means that there's robust political coverage, there's an opportunity for journalists to report on the news without fearing for their lives or, or fearing that they may be imprisoned. Uh, there, there's an independent judiciary that will, will, will uphold uh, freedom of expression as, as a right. Um, and, and so one in seven people, only one in seven people around the world. Uh, live in a country with a free press. Um, the other thing I think that people might not anticipate or expect is that in the era of satellite television and internet, that actually media freedom and internet freedom are declining. Um, at least when you're talking about the degree to which people are able to use this for pol for reporting and discussing issues of political uh, and social significance. Uh, that you have more and more restrictions, whether they be from governments or from non-state actors, on, on journalists' ability to report the news and on media companies' ability to spread that news and on Internet users, uh, bloggers, uh, and other online activists uh, to challenge some of those restrictions by taking full advantage of the Internet uh, to, make, you know, to, 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 to document information and to, and to spread it. So here you see the division of the countries around the world based on the most recent edition that was published uh, last May. So this is through to the end of, of 2013. And what you see is you see, if you look by country, a, uh, a breakdown that's about by, one, by third. So about one third of the countries in the world are rated as having a, a press that is free, which means there's a robust opportunity for political co coverage of political and social issues. Journalists do, are not, do not have to fear um, significantly for their own safety. Um, there's a possibility in space in terms of the regulatory environment to start media outlets, uh, to get advertising, and so forth. So that, that's kind of what falls under countries with a free environment. Yeah, can you tell us a little more about the methodology you use to collect data across different regions in China, across to, and how do you take uh, regional diversity into consideration in your research and in your um, presentation of your research? Sure. Um, well, one of the things that we do try to focus on are um, partly because of the degree of regional diversity um, is information that reflects on the central government. So, for example, in a, an analysis of censorship directives, there are censorship directives that are issued by central authorities and ones that are issued by provincial authorities. Unfortunately, the sample available of the provincial ones from provincial authorities isn't really robust enough in order to enable a serious examination of cross-regional differences. So, uh, but on the other hand, the centrally issued directives obviously would be relevant to the country nationwide. So, for example, when we did the, the analysis of the censorship directives, we focused only on the centrally issued ones because that was a way of being able to hone in on what is important to the central government, what's considered politically sensitive, what are the different methods that they're using. That being said, there is some very interesting scholarly research that other people have done with huge data sets, for example, of how censorship of microblogs works and plays out in different parts of the country. And there, for example, you could see that censorship was more intense in a sensitive area like Tibet uh, versus other parts, of, let's say places like Guangzhou or Guangdong, uh, which is known as a province that's a little bit more open politically and economically. So from that perspective, we're able to make use of some very innovative research that other people have done um, in order to identify certain trends. Um, but we're, 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 we're often mostly focusing um, on what's coming really from the top in terms of the central authorities, and that's most relevant, to, as relevant as possible to, to nationwide. Now, one of the very interesting things about the evolution of internet controls, including in a country like China, 
is that we actually did this. Um, this is a very recent search that I just did with a research assistant um, uh, a couple of days ago, um, about two years ago. And at that time, we, did, we actually compared yahoo.hk and yahoo.cn because we're like, well, this is the same company. Let's see what results you get outside the firewall and what results you get inside the firewall. Well, at the time, what happened was that it was much more nuanced. You saw outside the firewall, again, a large number of results from a diverse array of sources. What you saw at yahoo.cn was that you, sent, you found only 97 results. And those results were very heavily influenced by Chinese government um, uh, media sources and state media. What's interesting is that we went to go do that now. Yahoo.cn does not exist anymore. And so that's another an example of actually one of the ways that the Chinese government has been very adept at squeezing out, um, using the, the firewall to block, um, uh, block international companies um, and squeezing them out of the market, and then having dominant uh, domestic companies uh, become the dominant sources of information, then using a variety of different legislative and, and um, business incentives um, to encourage and in many ways coerce them uh, in, into implementing censorship on behalf of the, of, the, of the government. We noticed that you make a number of recommendations at the end of your report. So um, what are some of the uh, problems, obstacles that you foresee when, um, when these recommendations are being implemented? Um, well, I would say uh, two obstacles. One is uh, political will, uh, and the other is money. <laughs> uh, so there's the obstacle of political will inside China uh, in terms of the degree to which uh, the government would be willing and, and really think about instituting um, changes that would provide a greater degree of openness uh, for the media and the internet. And in fact, because one of the findings is the report of the report is that that type of lib top-down liberalization is unlikely, we didn't even really include many recommendations to the Chinese government. The other is political will outside of China. And given the economic um, importance of China and the way in which the Chinese authorities will often use that economic clout to try to push back against efforts by other governments um, uh, to, to, to mention human rights or uh, to take action to try to expand internet freedom, um, there's a real challenge when it comes to political will by governments other than China's. Um, the other, and then that, I would say that feeds into the money question uh, in terms of the resources that civil society initiatives may have at their disposal. Um, uh, Technologists who are, for instance, trying to design uh, tools that enable Internet users to jump the so-called Great Firewall. Um, those types of initiatives, um, as well as investigative journalism, um, both by foreign and by Chinese journalists, all of those face very serious uh, funding uh, and resource restrictions, um, either both because of the general situation for media in the, around the world, but even more so because the Chinese government is also very adept uh, at using its economic clout uh, to cut off sources of funding uh, for civil society initiatives, whether those be, uh, be, be for instance, from certain corporate donors uh, or, or other sources. So, so it's, a, it's a challenge. Great, Sarah. Um, this is very insightful, very interesting. Thank you.